And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Rick Olson, on the end of globalization, question mark. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to have an opportunity to speak with you because I so enjoy uh, conversations with people who are not only interested in lifelong learning, but also ab about foreign affairs because I've traveled to 41 countries and I just love to travel and uh, get familiar with issues uh, worldwide. I will share my screen um, and we will get started. Okay, um, like was said, uh, this is a, a question mark, the end of globalization, because it's certainly not a certainty that it will happen. Um, now, we're talking about really a trend that has been going on for a long, long time, because really, really from the start of mankind, uh, they've been dispersing worldwide from Africa. And we, um, you know, studying Roman history and so forth and Greek and Roman history, you know that there were traders throughout the Mediterranean and then around Africa. We know the Chinese early on were very active traders in the Indian Ocean. Um, and over time, there's been huge movements of people in various directions. So, you know, for example, the Mongols coming from, from the Chinese area, area and moving, moving west. And then, of course, we all learned about Marco Polo on the Silk Road um, and getting silks and, and spices and so forth uh, somewhere around uh, 1400 or somewhere around there. So, so we know this has been going on at some, to some degree for a long, long time. So really the question is, uh, what's different now and, and why are, are things happening the way they are? Um, so let's first start with the definition of globalism. And it's really the increasing interconnectedness and integration of people throughout the world. Um, it's just been so much uh, more than used to be. Um, and it's the idea that just something that happens in a faraway country can, ha can have impacts here locally. So it, it's a very much of a ripple effect around the world now. Um, so let's back, go through history a little bit um, and, and what's happened. Um, Things really began to pick up in trade with the Industrial Revolution uh, in the late 1700s and 1800s. Um, there was a great reduction in cost of transportation, uh, particularly across the Atlantic and so forth with the steamboats, significantly cut the travel time and therefore cost of trade across the Atlantic and elsewhere around the world, obviously, as well. So what you'll hear over and over again is this reduced cost in transportation and reduced cost of communication that has really spurred a lot of the international trade growth. Um, with the transatlantic cable uh, being laid in 1858, that would obviously cut the in communication costs uh, greatly in time across the Atlantic. But um, back in 1776, you know, the, basically the same time as the Revolutionary War was happening, but not. Um, Adam Smith published a, a book, had a longer title, but it's known as The Wealth of Nations. And in that book, he was really argued against our countries being protectionist. Um, previously, there had been attempts to, to uh, protect the, the industries of, of a country. And really what the idea was that that was going to um, increase the extent uh, or the amount of silver and gold that a country would be able to hold. Um, and he argued against the various types of protectionism, such as tariffs, import and export licensing, quotas on what could be imported or exported, imposing higher safety standards on imports higher than for, for domestic production, um, and uh, domestic sourcing requirements, such as you know, sometimes we have in the United States for, for cars that X percent of the, the parts have to be made in America. Um, so th you know, this was a, a change from the idea that the tariffs really being protectionist and being a major source of revenue for the governments that Adam Smith's idea said was the real wealth of a country was a country's productivity. So all during this time too, uh, basically capitalism was, was operating around the world. Um, and um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about capitalism because a lot of people don't really know what it is and what, it's based, what the theory is based on. Um, number one, we should recognize that free enterprise and free markets have been highly successful around the world. 
um, even the growth of, of China uh, after 1992 and so forth, the big, the big growth was really because of the, the allowing more and more of the, of the ideas of capitalism to be run in, be in play. Um, so it, it's actually an economic theory that when I went to graduate school uh, in economics or agricultural economics, um, I, we learned that it was based on a set of assumptions um, such as capital assets are owned. People can own the tools of production. Uh, and prices are a signal that allocate resources among users. You know, if something's lower priced, then that's what you buy. Uh, and if all exchanges are voluntary and mutually beneficial, no one's forcing anybody to do anything uh, in terms of transactions. There are many small competitive producers and many small buyers um, that there is perfect information and then one of the very, very important assumptions when it comes to international trade is that resources are mobile. They, they can go all over the place to, to the highest use, but there are no transaction costs. Um, and that obviously with, with trade is not true. Um, and there's no constraints at borders. People, products, money, and resources can move to the highest value use. Now, obviously these assumptions are not always met in reality even in the most free enterprise countries. So before we move on back to international trade, let's little talk about a little bit about um, where capitalism is not perfect. So there are some problems with unfettered private enterprise. Um, first of all, we know their business cycles, booms and busts, and recessions and, and then recoveries and so forth. We know about bubbles. Um, we went through the housing bubble um, in you know, mid, last last uh, decade uh, and, and, and the bust that caused. And uh, now there's some questions, is there a bubble in the stock market? We hope not. I'm hoping my investments stay, stay good as well as yours. Um, then, there, then there are monopolies and oligopolies. And over time, and some of these have become too obvious and then if society does or government does something about that, you know, like um, Teddy Roosevelt and the big trust buster and uh, break, breaking up, um, uh, oil and and uh, and the railroad companies and so forth, and uh, and during our times we saw AT and T broken up, um, and now there's questions about should some of the tech companies be broken up. That's still an issue. Um, there are externalities, and an externality is something where I do something that causes harm to someone else, but I'm not responsible for compensating that person. And a cl clear example of that is is emitters of carbon dioxide burning fossil fuels, releasing carbon dioxide into the air, um, causing climate change. And we're not, as users of fossil fuels, we're not responsible for compensating anybody for that damage we may do. Um, also, there's a problem of imperfect information. Um, it's also known as asymmetrical information um, because Although there may be willing buyers and willing sellers, usually someone knows more about that transaction than another. A prime example would be your extended water auto warranty that you may have gotten a call about. Uh, so don't blame me if you get breakdown down on the highway. But anyway, um, why, do, why are they offering these? Because they can make money out of them. So statistically, buying these extended warranties is a bad idea. Uh, they've got more information than we as buyers would. Um, and there are public goods such as national defense, highway, water, and sewer, and so forth. Um, then there's a prime idea of capitalism that there's the idea of creative destruction. If something new comes along, the, the new idea where it wins, so the old idea that it replaces, uh, you know, goes out of business. You know, the, old, the old example that was used was automobiles and the builders of buggy, buggies and buggy whips. Um, but one of the things that we've come to realize uh, is that in capitalism, there are almost always wealth and income inequalities, uh, which is a, a rising problem in many, many countries these days. Um, and then there are some kinds of things that would not happen uh, without public efforts. Uh, how, how would a, a private company uh, build an airport um, that would serve you know, international travel. And obviously capitalism does not deal with the idea that there are nation states, there are barriers to free transfers. 
So while capitalism has been great in terms of really increasing the, the lifestyles of, of people around the world, um, it's not perfect. And at times government needs to step in and make some corrections. Now, around the same time that Adam Smith was talking about uh, the cap importance of capitalism, the importance of, of companies specializing, and even within companies, workers specializing in a particular component, um, there was another economist, David Ricardo, really encouraging countries to specialize because he came up with the idea, actually he had previously, this idea had been developed more by uh, John Stuart Mills, but uh, David Ricardo was the one who more um, popularized it. Um, he says that you will have greater total production if countries specialize where they have a comparative advantage. And then that total production can be shared on, among the various countries. But basically the idea of you're gonna create a bigger pie. Um, unfortunately, uh, the idea of comparative advantage does not take care of the idea of how the pie is cut uh, because the theory disregards adjustment costs and distributional consequences. And especially in local labor markets where, where industries are greatly affected uh, by either offshoring or outsourcing uh, of, of companies or, or parts of companies or products. Prime example of that was I've, I've spent uh, much of my life in Michigan where auto industry is extremely important. Um, and I was there, you know, around 2000 until I moved to Minnesota in uh, end of 2014. Um, Michigan was just greatly uh, devastated by the auto industry being hurt uh, through international trade. Of course, they shot themselves in the foot as well, quite a bit, but uh, it was, uh, it, you know, they just they could not compete with some of the Korean and, and uh, Japanese automobiles. Now, there is a great deal of, of intellectual disagreement concerning just how important international trade is to the loss of jobs in the United States. Um, and, but there was a study uh, that showed that the import growth from China in the 12 years, 1999 to 2011, led to an employment reduction in the United States of 2. Point million jobs. What that study did was rebut the idea that jobs is really primarily caused by automation. Uh, it showed that, that uh, international trade and, uh, and the growth of the imports from China have really had an impact. Uh, of course, China is not the only uh, point of uh, that people are thinking about. They keep also think about how about uh, Canada and Mexico and so forth. How much has that affected? But uh, I'll come back to that in a, in a later in a later point. Um, also, during the late seventeen late seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds, nineteen hundreds, we've had just a just a tremendous number of important in, innovations. Um, I mentioned the steamships, uh, railroads and canals have been a major, major factor. Um, of course, the invention of the telephone and telegraph just greatly uh, it decreased the cost of, of communication. Uh, electric lighting in, in 1870 was a big deal. Uh, refrigeration made a big, big difference when it comes to food, particularly. Um, and then the internal combustion engines again dropped the cost of production. Um, McCormick Reaper on agricultural side and, and cotton gin were very, very big along with the radio. So all these inventions, a lot of this trade, what that did was it really increased the standard of living for millions and millions around the world. This, what, what humans have done in this area has to be considered a very, very good success story. So um, along this time, there's also countries that have begun to do some of the greater specialization that Adam Smith uh, recommended and David Ricardo. And a good prime example of that was how England specialized in the textile production. Uh, well, America, or south, south part of the country anyway, produced cotton and, and ship. That trade was very, very important uh, in uh, the 1800s um, leading up to the Civil War and, and beyond. Um, also, England or the, or the British Empire around the world, uh, they had colonies all over the place and, and they were really getting the raw inputs and so forth from these countries. Um, and in fact, uh, 
it, it can be argued that colonization around the world is really one of the primary causes of some of the backward situations in some of the countries yet today. Because all, during all this growth period time, there is what's called the great divergence. The developed countries, their standard of living was growing dramatically. Developing countries, not so much. Uh, and so that was becoming really obvious. That, um, and anyway, we're seeing all this terrible growth and so right, or terrific growth, I should say. Then World War I and the Great Depression came. Oh, those are called the lost years when it comes to international trade. International trade really did not pick up until after World War II. Um, what happened? Uh, why does this, was this so bad? After World War I, um, the victor victorious countries really imposed really extremely high reparations I get from Germany, um, which really kept uh, Germany down, uh, very difficult to recover, and really set the stage for World War II, Nazism. Um, and then uh, countries raised tariffs to try to protect the country, their, their own industries. An example is the American uh, Smoot Hawley tariffs. Yeah. But during this time, um, e economists, uh, really, uh, particularly Milton Friedman, really studying, studying this, really says that there was really a lot of monetary fund mismanagement. And that just caused the collapse in international finance. Our Federal Reserve System at that time, frankly, did not do a very good job. So all this collectively really caused a, a great deal of problems, not only World War I and, and Great Depression. It just took a long time to get out of that situation, not until after World War II. So what we're really looking at is after World War II being really the golden years. Um, first of all, the United States uh, assisted um, countries to get back on their feet that had been devastated by the war. Rather than having very, very high reparations against Germany, we actually helped them get back on their feet. And in fact, Germany can now be considered one of our greatest allies. Uh, it, it, so uh, that's been a really, very su good success story there. But they also um, developed uh, what we would call the new international order, uh, an international economic structure, a multilateral geopolitical and economic system, not bilateral, just country to country, but countries gathering together to do things. Uh, and the, the prime example of that is the United Nations, which primarily uh, deals with political purposes, but they've got sub agencies that uh, are really important on the economic side of things. The International Monetary Fund, the IMF, provides stability and smooth function of the international monetary system to underpin the multilateral trading system. Extremely, extremely important agency, particularly um, with uh, many of the developing countries or even, even Italy and Greece and when they have their, their money problems, the IMF uh, is imposing various conditions on loans to them. Um, the IMF is extremely, extremely important agency worldwide. Then there's also the World Bank, uh, which supports economic development, particularly in the developing countries, because they make low interest loans for development projects. Um, so, you know, that's been an evolving thing over the years as well. It has done uh, lots of different things in developing countries with, uh, frankly, mixed results. Um, the, um, then uh, there's also, there was an originally uh, an international trade organization proposed as part of the development of the United Nations, but that was never uh, ratified by Congress. Uh, ultimately, uh, in 1947, um, the president uh, created by executive order the General Agreement on Tariff and Trades, also known as GATT. That eventually evolved into the World Trade Organization in 1994. So, uh, if I refer to WTO, we're talking about the World Trade Organization. Okay, now that really provided the legal framework um, for uh, the international economy. WTO gathers and shares data amongst countries. What they really have done is they've lowered trading costs through agreement and customs forms, standard sanitary, sanitary standards, and so forth. So in other words, the terms of trade, standard terms of trade, which would make it so there's not having to be always individual contracts have to go through with all the terms. 
uh, it really reduces the cost. Uh, and then they've led many rounds of multilateral trade negotiations on reciprocal reductions on trade barriers. Uh, now the Uruguay ground round, the last one was not been ratified, but they, I think that was like the eighth or ninth round uh, that they've gone through, lowering tariffs, lowering tariffs, lowering tariffs, down to the point there, on average uh, three and 4% uh, around the world. Um, and then uh, something very important is they provide a dispute settlement mechanism where complaints can be brought. If, uh, if um, a company, uh, our country is thought to be violating the terms of WTO with their agreements, uh, you can go to WO to the dispute settlement mechanism to get your case heard. Not, not the same as international court, but it's, it's, uh, it's basically the international court for trade. Now, the World Trade Organization is based on three principles. Uh, the members are to extend national treatment to foreign traders. In other words, a foreign company gets the same rights in court as a domestic company. Second is that their protection against imports should be provided only by tariffs, and there should be no export subsidies. We'll come to that back to that point too. Um, and that there should be most favored nation treatment by each country of goods and services transactions so that the same tariff protection is applied to all countries. The results of this has been just an extremely rapid recovery from World War II. Um, what, the growth that we've seen around the world that you and I have experienced has just been plainly awesome. Um, there has been a dramatic lowering of tariffs worldwide, where at one time there were maybe 50% uh, tariffs, which would basically almost double, by the time you had transportation and communication costs, you almost double the cost of a product from, from where it came to, to where you were sold down to maybe 15% for transportation and, and communication and tariffs down to three or 4%, much, much, much lower. Um, and, and transportation costs have really, really dropped even further than that, uh, particularly with the big super tankers that are now, now uh, that are utilized, super cargo ships. They're just huge, absolutely huge. Um, so there's really been a worldwide boom in international trade. And it grow, rose twice as fast as the rate of growth in the world gross domestic product. 1947, trade was only 7% of GDP. 98, 17%. 2019, over 60%. Just amazing explosion in international trade. Now, the developing countries have not fared quite as well. Um, after World War II, many, many of the countries that had been colonies of various countries, uh, England, France, you, uh, Portugal, and so forth, um, they developed in independence um, after World War II. And to try to bootstrap their way to prosperity, they tried import substitution, trying to be self-sufficient in, in the products they consumed by encouraging domestic industries, um, by raising tariffs. Unfortunately, import substitution has not been successful much of anywhere. Um, uh, on, in contrast, um, the East Asian tigers opened up their borders, reformed their economic policies, and thrived. Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan all have been done extremely well, and are now they're, they're developed countries. Um, very successful. And in, in recent years, some others have tried to copy their success, and Vietnam has opened up significantly. Um, and in fact, because of rising wages costs in China, um, Vietnam is getting um, an awful lot of uh, relocated companies. Um, so getting to be a success story, amazing from, from being at war in Vietnam to being a really good uh, source of uh, products these days. Now, I would be remiss in this presentation if I didn't, we didn't talk about the rise of China uh, because China is the big elephant in the room, obviously. Um, the attempts at reforms, uh, economic reforms started in about 1978, um, but then it stagnated. It's just, but 
then Deng Xiaoping, uh, then in uh, 1992, really said, we've got to shift it. We've got to open up to some capitalism here in China. And, and then that started working well. Because before, before that, the Chinese economy was dominated by state ownership and central planning, similar to the USSR. Well, Deng Xiaoping looked at the collapse of the Soviet Union in, in 1991 and saying, whoa, we need to do something else. That's one of the things that uh, really got their attention. They've got to, uh, you know, central planning and, and communism just was a failed, failed uh, experiment. Um, ultimately, through growth, uh, the, uh, opening up, China was able to join the World Trade Organization in 2001. And incidentally, uh, Russia did join the WTO in 2012 as well. Um, now, obviously, China's low wages attracted companies who are trying to maximize their profit. Um, because, you know, low wages, uh, you can make cheaper products, and uh, that's attractive to consumers. Um, the internet was also big in all this transformation because you could transfer information really quickly. So you could have a company headquarters in the United States, have a manufacturing uh, uh, factory in China and stay in you know, instant communication with it, no problem. Um, so the re result was that hundreds of thousands of manufacturing operations were established in China. So that's called offshoring from the United States to China. Um, uh, companies moved their operations overseas. But companies also began to change how they did business significantly. They just started buying components or services needed to maximize its value chain, a little different orientation. Uh, rather than, rather than uh, having all your products or components built in one place and putting it together, you might pr have components from multiple situation places and then put together. Similar to like Apple, most of the components are built in China, made in China, but the uh, putting together the Apple iPhones are, are made by Foxconn in Taiwan. Um, so um, different pieces can be done in different places. Um, but the truth is manufacturing usually is not a highly profitable business. The intellectual property is really rose as being the place where most of the value produced is produced. Intellectual property is key. And, and uh, to, to show that, uh, uh, someone came up with the idea of a smile curve. Um, and what the smile curve does is it focus, when we talk about value chain management, really focus on where in the entire process the company is making its money. Um, and um, as you can see, the, the, uh, the, the shallower uh, curve here, dotted line, is where things used to be, you know, like in uh, 1990. Um, and manufacturing didn't, uh, on, the, on the left, left side, it shows how much where the value is added. Uh, manufacturing did provide some, some, some value. Um, uh, on the pre-production side, the research, uh, research and development, design, and logistics of purchasing, that made some money. Uh, and on the post-production side, logistics and marketing services made some money. But since 1990, the value produced manufacturing has just really dropped. Um, and that's a, just a very low profit area in the value chain. Apple doesn't make much money when it comes to production of its phones itself. They make their service, they make their money on the marketing of them, the services of them, um, and in, in the R&D and, and design uh, prior to being manufactured. So, uh, so manufacturing is, like I say, not a high profit business. It really goes to where you can get that, the very cheapest labor, how you produce those pro products the cheapest. Okay, back to WTO. Um, one of the key things in there was what they called uh, preferential trading arrangements. Now, this was an exception to the WTO uh, calling for non discrimination among trading partners. Remember, I talked about one of the three principles that was non discrimination between trading partners? Well, the preferential trading agreements is an exception to that. Now, countries can get together and mutually agree to lower all of their tariffs among themselves and make it a free trade area. No tariffs among themselves, but in a 
fair trading arrangement, you, each of the countries can still negotiate tariffs with other countries by themselves. This is in contrast to how Europe has organized as a customs union, uh, where there's no tariffs among themselves, but they negotiate tariffs with non-member countries in, as one block. The EU uh, is, a, is a single uh, country, basically, when it comes to trading uh, agreements. Now let's little talk a little bit how the uh, European Union has, has evolved. Initially, six countries got together in 1950 and formed the European Coal and Steel Community. Um, it, it created a, a European trade area. Um, 57, it evolved a little bit more of a common market. Then it got even more standardized uh, in 1968, particularly for trade and agriculture. Um, 1985 was significant when the first five countries signed the Shenzhen Agreement. Now, the Shenzhen Agreement is really the idea that um, you can travel from one country to country within those countries that are signed this agreement without needing your passport, free movement of people. So really we're talking so far about the free movement of products and now this is actually free movement of people. Um, the common market, uh, European Union common market came more established uh, in 93. And then the free movement of money or the establishing of a single currency in these countries was with the Eurozone in 1998. So this has evolved over time. Um, and um, what's very interesting about how this evolved is this is different from the United States in that our, our states to get tied together is tied together with a constitution. These countries are tied together by treaties and agreements, uh, and which causes a problem with if you if um, in the study of Brexit and the European Union, uh, you may have learned that uh, one of the difficulties with the European Union is to change things requires unanimous agreement. So that makes it pretty difficult to make significant changes. Um, th this slide shows the growth of the European Union, the darkest blue. Uh, is the original ones and then the light, progressively lighter ones show over time as, as countries have joined the European Union. Uh, you know, Switzerland has remained independent of all this. Uh, Norway has uh, been state independent of this. Uh, and you see Turkey and some other countries uh, in, the, in the Balkans, uh, you know, they are hoping to become part of the European Union but haven't yet met the requirements. Um, on the other hand, the Eurozone, um, um, shows uh, the countries that have had the common currency. So you can, you know, I lead tours through Europe in, in May, and uh, we can go from, from Finland to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, we go through Poland, Czech, uh, Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, Hung uh, Austria, and Hungary. Um, and the only time we need to get the other exchange uh, other than the Euro is in, in, in Poland, Czech Republic, and Hungary. They have their own currency. Other than that, it's really convenient to go from place to place. Obviously, convenience, lower cost of, of doing business and so forth, makes it easier to trade among those countries. Okay, then there's Shenzhen Agreement. Uh, that again, I'm talking about and putting your passports away. You can go from country to country without having to worry about passports. Makes it very, very easy. Of course, uh, I've been communicating with uh, the, the bus, minibus company uh, in Lithuania, and I've been told that in May, we may not need our passports going from country to country, so we may need to take a rap COVID-19 rapid antigen test to go across borders. Yeah, makes it a little more difficult, um, So, uh, but that's COVID for you. So, okay, uh, so these preferential trading agreements have become increasingly important. Now, that prime example has, was NAFTA uh, in 1993, where US, Mexico, and Canada came up with this agreement. Um, what some people don't know is that's really, uh, it superseded a 1988 agreement between US and Canada. Um, but that's since been replaced by the USMCA, the United States, Mexico, and Canada agreement, which President Trump uh, negotiated, which took effect in July 1, 2020. Uh, not real, real significant changes between NAFTA and USMCA, 
Um, but uh, that's, that's the rule of the law of the land now. Um, meanwhile, uh, China and 14 other Asian countries have formed a preferential trading agreement in 2020 called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Um, they did this after President Trump pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which had been already negotiated and such, um, but we pulled out. Um, so uh, that uh, is, a, is some, what some people think was a major mistake. Uh, anyway, uh, there's other country, groups of countries that have tried this and, and have some of these in, in place. They're becoming increasingly important around the world. So again, let's back up a little bit and look at what are some of the major changes in international trade. Originally, uh, let's say Marco Polo's time, the trade was in very high value, low volume goods, so, you know, because transportation was so difficult and expensive. We wanted low volume, high value. Now, almost everything's traded, um, you know, except concrete and, and such that are very heavy and uh, has to be produced locally. There's been a big shift from finished product to really lots of trade in parts or components to things. And now a big, big uh, increase in re recent years has been from just goods to services is now being more and more uh, traded internationally. Financial services have been a big one, particularly. Obviously, um, tourism and such, are those are services, those have, have expanded greatly too. You go in many parts of the world and you'll find a lot of Chinese uh, tourists there, for example. Um, and uh, then there have been a, a big, big increase in students going to universities in other countries. Um, so yeah, that's, that's big. In, in Europe particularly, um, you know, students can go to college free uh, in, in the EU. So a lot of people have been moving to all over the place to go to college. Um, and during this time, rate of innovation has really accelerated because you, you, can, you can get an idea that, that comes out of another country and it's immediately transmitted to someplace else and somebody else picks up on that and makes a little more change on that. And the rate of in, in, innovation has really increased. Um, another big change, the international financial markets have globalized. Um, you can have something that happens in, in Uruguay and it'll have an impact on the financial markets in New York or London. Um, so, but the, what has stayed uh, the same since the World War II is that the US dollar has remained the world reserve currency. Previously, uh, world banks or excuse me, country banks and so forth uh, stored their money in gold and silver. Uh, now, other countries other than the US, when they want to keep a certain amount of quote money, they keep it in US dollars. Um, so there's been discussion over the last few years is it, will the US dollar um, remain the world currency, world reserve currency? Um, and um, China is a potential competitor. The difficulty is the lack of transparency with financial trades and so forth in China. And that has been a uh, really something holding China from being too competitive. So US dollar is still going to be con considerably important probably for the foreseeable future. Now let's talk about the, 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 the supply chain, which is really affects uh, international trade. Um, rather than having one company produce a product, now there are multiple companies involved in it and making many components that are then brought together and put together into a product. Um, also what's, what's changed has been from companies holding inventories of the components, now they use just-in-time inventory practices. They do this to minimize their costs of the inventory, um, costs of, of money being held, uh, basically. Um, and so they, all the various components are timed to come just, just when you need them. Uh, but when you have multiple supply levels, uh, you end up with a great deal more complexity. So this is more difficult. Um, and many com companies have single product suppliers. Uh, I'm only gonna get um, like automobiles, for example, I'm only gonna get mufflers from such and such company. 
uh, I'm only going to get, get uh, steering wheels from such and such company. Um, the, the problem with that is when there is a kink in the system in any one of those components that, that say an automobile is made of, the whole plant needs to shut down or stop because a car cannot be finished without a single one of those without having every one of those single products or components. Um, so that that's, has caused some problems, uh, especially with just-in-time inventory. Um, and um, the other problem with, the, with, with supply chains today is that uh, we really are highly reliant upon the internet and information technology. And we've seen that these can be very easily disrupted through hacks and uh, Trojan uh, chips and, and viruses and so forth. Um, so there's, although the supply chain has been very, very successful in reducing costs um, over time, um, this also creates some great vulnerability, um, which some of which has raised some skepti skepticism about trade and globalization. Now, you know, we've seen this uh, with the rise of tr Trump and, and, and the supporters of Trump, uh, how they're skeptical about trade and globalization. And, and, but it's not just him, it's just really a feeling among a lot of people. And, and why has that happened? Well, the 9-11 attack really kind of began to raise some questions of how reliant really should we be on other countries like the oil companies in the Middle East? Hmm, uh, not, not so good, because we basically have gone to war so far just to protect our supplies of oil in many cases. Uh, that's not so been so good. And then with the 2007, 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession, that again caused a little bit of loss of faith in the capitalism system uh, and how we're how we're all tied together globally and so forth. Um, it's this general unease which really is is a problem. But uh, then it's true. Basically, I mentioned that one. A study that showed that 2.4 million jobs have been lost simply because of trade from import it's from more from China from 1999 to 2011. There's been loss of jobs due to closed factories. Creative destruction through capitalism is part of that, but um, and this is where there's some argument whether what what has caused these loss of jobs. The study I quoted uh, said it was a large part uh, trade. Um, the author of this part of the uh, great decisions really was talking that more about automation. Um, so there's really a dispute among economists and experts in this area of just what's causing it all. Um, but what happens is um, there's been tremendous loss of jobs. Now, the real problem with globalization is that there was a study that said that since, uh, uh, you know, after World War II, there's probably been an Benefit, individual benefit of about $10,000 per person because of globalization. Man, that's great. Um, the problem with that politically is that those benefits are dispersed over many, many, many people in small amounts that you don't even notice. Um, whereas the costs are localized into small communities or industries or so forth. When it comes to lobbying policies, you don't see any um, United Moms for cheaper Pampers or, um, or whatever, because um, th their benefits have been so small and distributed for that particular product. Whereas, whereas industries that are threatened or part, parts of the country that are threatened or you know, they can, they, they have lobbyists and put pressure on politicians. So dispersed benefits, concentrated losses. One of the, one of the big problems on this area. This, this has really led uh, to a rejection of multilateralism and trade, primarily by Trump, uh, pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I already mentioned, imposing tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. He denounced the World Trade Organization. And he refused to approve new judges to the WTO dispute settlement mechanism, basically making that inoperable. So people can't bring their complaints concerning 
violations of, of the WTO agreements. So that's a major issue. But uh, let's come back to, to COVID-19 and what it's done is, is when, when China um, initially stopped the import or exportation of masks and, and rubber gloves and so forth to the United States, uh, it really showed the importance of this global supply train and chain and how it can be disrupted. Uh, and it showed how a country could use tariffs and protectionism like this in, in a manipulative way, uh, which, which was a very obvious exercise of power. So going, shooting war and diplomacy are not the only levers of power that, you, that the countries can use. Trade can be used as well and can be manipulated. So, um, much of the thought about uh, international trade and globalism, much of focus has been on China. So let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about China right here. Because the United States has become increasingly vulnerable to espionage, economic and military sabotage, high scale data theft. Uh, China uses the supply chain to gain access to critical infrastructure and steal sensitive information, research technology, and industrial secrets. I read another book uh, by an expert in surveillance and uh, internet and so forth. And he says, and he's, he was in position to know that there is probably not a single company in the Fortune, five, five, Fortune 500 that have not been hacked by China and their trade secrets sold, stolen. Whoa, there's an agency in the United States that collects all the information when people need security clearances. They hacked into that. China had access to all the information of all the people in the United States who had gotten security clearances. Whoa, not good. Okay, uh, so that's been really, we're, we're vulnerable to that. Uh, and there's, a, there's now some push to be less vulnerable, but we still have a long way to go. Um, there is risk of, of countries inserting malware, like viruses or Trojan chips, in important information technology networks. For example, in 2014, the US acknowledged that China had the capability to shut down the US power system. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. Is this theoretical? No. Uh, Russia did that in Ukraine before they invaded in 2014. It's, People know how to do this. Uh, so we need to harden our system so this can't happen. Um, what uh, experts are afraid of is the installation of Trojan chips or infiltration of viruses that affect the product performance. Now, this is some maybe hard to believe that Huawei have, and there's some and surveillance cameras, cameras supplied by Chinese companies uh, have been installed in military bases. Hmm, do we want surveillance by foreign countries going on in our military bases? Probably not. Um, and the other th concerns are that China produces 74% of the dro drones worldwide, very, very uh, much of increase in, in use throughout the world. And I was talking to my, my son um, just yesterday who, who works for Excel. Uh, and as a senior reactor operator. Um, and he says, the nuclear power plant is most vulnerable um, by drones. So you're not gonna get through the gate to in, into there, but you could very easily get attack a uh, power plant with a drone. Um, and another concern is that China dominates the rail, rail car production and supplies. Uh, U.S. has been some major cities have purchased the real cars from China, um, but using them in the Washington D.C. metro area was blocked uh, because of fear of well, how many critical important people in national security use the Detroit metro system. The, 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 yeah, the, the District Columbia metro system. Excuse me. Uh, they didn't want that, so that was that was prohibited to be used in that system. But Something that's going to be increasingly important um, is 
the fact that rare earth minerals needed in virtually every electronic product, particularly batteries and, and, and such like that, um, China's got virtual monopoly on that. There's only one company in the United States that has even the capability of, of um, working with these uh, rare earth minerals. So uh, that's a big concern. Um, so um, also a concern with China has been the collection of consumer data because basically anything that's civilian with Russia, actually with China is tied right into military. Um, so really the concerns in general is that China has become a manufacturing superpower. The US has been industrialized. China has been very aggressive in the South China Sea and building islands and then militarizing them. They have taken over Hong Kong. That's a done deal. Uh, they really consider Taiwan a part of China and one day will become part of the rest of China. They are doing the Belt and Road Initiative in many, 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 many countries, which is giving them political leverage and so forth around other countries. And then in places like Sri Lanka, where they, a port was built, and then they could have, couldn't afford to pay for it. China now has a port at Sri Lanka that they basically own. Um, also a concern is, like I say, how China manipulated the availability of masks and, and rubber gloves. They've also used economic power against other countries in different ways for various pretend reasons um, that have nothing to do with trade. Um, for example, um, when, when the United States wanted more access to Wuhan to, Wuhan to see what's happening, how did, how did COVID-19 start? What's the source of that? Australia said, yeah, we need, we need to have access to that. China didn't like that. And so they imposed a ban on lobster imports from, from Australia, which was very, very important because China accounted for 96% of Australia exports of these lobsters, uh, worth a half million dollars per year, big deal. Um, so, you know, how much more they're gonna continue to do this is a concern. Um, so then there is just growing concern of Chinese as a military power. They have made massive strides in terms of their Navy, um, and apparently I just read a few days ago about where they have mock-ups of American ships out in the desert that are used for target practice. Um, a lot of this is crazy, causing a great deal of concern among our military leaders. Let's look a little more at China. Supply, China just has gotten to be a huge manufacturer. They manufacture more than the United States, Germany, South Korea, and the United Kingdom combined. And meanwhile, many US industries have been destroyed. They become a mega trader. As a percent of their total GMP, they peaked up here about 62%. They've fallen down a little bit uh, in terms of percentage because some of their domestic industry has grown uh, significantly. But they are a mega trader, trade far more uh, than the United States. Um, US has been deindustrializing. Manufacturing has a drop. Percent of GMP has just dropped. Still, we're major, major manufacturers, but our percentage of GMP has dropped. Uh, obviously, services have become more and more important uh, over time. Uh, but also, manufacturing employees, uh, that, that has taken a drop. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more about Chinese economic power, because they say that is capitalism with Chinese characteristics. As I mentioned, uh, they joined the WTO in 2001, but they don't play by its rules. They limit the market access for imported goods, foreign manufacturers, and foreign services. They offer substantial government guidance, resources, and regulatory support to Chinese industries, particularly in the state-owned industries or enterprises. Another favorite company is targeted for moving up the economic value chain. I'll talk a little more about that in just a bit. They offer loan subsidies, land grants, and permitting preferences. They have discriminatory regulatory barriers. And they require foreign companies to give China their intellectual property, many of which can be very helpful for military purposes. So remember when I talked about the major principles of WTO, that tariffs can only be used to protect domestic, only, only tariffs can be used to protect domestic industries. 
I want you to look at that list. Obviously, tariffs are not the only thing that are being used. Another principle is no export subsidy, subsidies. Hmm. China is offering different ways to help their, co their companies. And uh, by, uh, complaints about this to the WTO dispute resolution mechanism uh, has not worked very well. Um, now, what, what really kind of raised worldwide concern was uh, the connection between military and civilian uh, fusion. Uh, they, did, they announced a Made in China 2025 master plan that they wanted to create economic dominance in these industries, next generation information technology, aerospace and aviation equipment, maritime vessels and engineering equipment, advanced rail equipment, energy savings and new energy vehicles, biopharmaceuticals and high performance medical devices. So companies in these areas are getting greater support from the Chinese company. They want to become dominant in these areas. So big question is the reason or the question mark in, at the start for the title of this is where do we go from here? What are, what are our options? Well, we could use further negotiations to restore uh, WTO efforts. We could ultimately go the other way, increase protectionism ourselves. Um, we could try some middle ground. Uh, for example, we could get together with the European Union and using my, by multilateral negotiations, then try to go against uh, companies that are abusing the system such as China. Or we could use preferential trading agreements with allies to create more regional trading blocks. Well, we're doing that to some extent uh, in, with Australia and so forth, and trying to, trying to block uh, or counteract uh, some of the Chinese, Chinese efforts there. But the bottom line is almost any of these that things that we will do to lessen globalization will entail huge losses to all. Globalization has been highly beneficial for most people. And like I said, those benefits have been broadly distributed. And unfortunately, the costs have been localized. And frankly, uh, our policies helping those local companies, those local areas and so forth that have been hurt have been pretty anemic. Uh, the, the law in the United States is that um, if you can prove that you've been hurt by, uh, by international trade, you might get some help, but it's very hard to prove that international trade was the problem as compared to some of the other things. So that hasn't worked very well. So that's the big question. What are we gonna do about it? It's not, we're not in the very best circumstance, um, but like so many issues that are discussed in great decisions, the reason these are brought up is that these are complex questions. They're not easy. They're not suitable for simple solutions. Simple things, they've been solved long ago. Hard ones are ones that we're faced with. So with that, I'll open up to questions and comments. And uh, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen uh, and, uh, oh, I guess, I guess you have. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, uh, um, very good. Well, now it is the turn of the audience. Um, I see that we already have some questions in the Q&A column, uh, but we have time for some more. So uh, don't be hesitant, uh, type your questions in and I will read them to our speaker, Rick Olson. And the first question uh, relates to, uh, the question is what services are a part of international trade or services, I guess, a component of international trade and which services? If so, well, one of the most obvious that we all are familiar with is travel, tourism. Um, but the financial services are ones that are becoming more and more prominent. And um, so um, particularly in some parts of the world that have very, very poor financial services, like in Africa, for example, um, there's some great opportunities. Um, and uh, so there's many, many uh, companies that would like to get into some of those kinds of markets more. 
Uh, speaking of financial services, that leads us straight to the next question. There are actually more than one question um, about the rise of uh, cryptocurrency and the effect that it uh, plays in uh, globalization, economic globalization. And, uh, and is there a concomitant um, uh, economic threat to the dominance of uh, US currency as the reserve currency? How does uh, cryptocurrency, the rise of cryptocurrency affect the things you've been talking about? Well, cryptocurrency is something I don't know a whole lot about, um, but I know um, reading some articles, uh, you know, Federal Reserve Board and others uh, in the financial markets uh, are concerned about uh, what impact they might have. Um, basically, cryptocurrency has no backing of any sort, uh, and so that is a concern. Um, you can create uh, bitcoins by using a tremendous amount of electricity. Um, to do a number of these computer transactions, blah, 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 until you create a Bitcoin. Um, but um, so there, there is concern about that. But um, their bottom line, people seek some security for their funds. And that is one of the reasons why the US dollar has been uh, so valued around the world. It is considered one of the most stable you know, currencies that people can invest in. Um, they don't want to put, you know, right now, you know, put your money in the cryptocurrency is basically speculation. Um, so you're not going to want to put a whole lot of money there. Uh, it might be fun and interesting, but uh, if you want security, it's not such a good idea. So we'll, we'll see. Um, I don't foresee that as really being the answer. Okay. Um, and the next questioner asks, are China and other countries vulnerable to our espionage? If not, why are they not? Well, I think I would be naive if I said the United States doesn't do any of that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we, our experts are doing um, some surveillance and some things. I don't know that they are doing harming of things, but I'm sure that they are spying in some way. Um, I, I would be, like I said, I'd be naive if I said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're, we're good guys. We're not going to do any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just to defend ourselves, we, we need to do some of that. Um, I, from what I've read, I uh, fully believe that uh, um, we, could, we, could, we could shut down Russia's uh, energy supply quite easily, for example. China, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how well they've done things and being able to block uh, our intrusion. Mm -hmm. I think maybe the questioner was uh, interested in whether we were capable of the same amount of disruption of their systems as they are of ours. And if, if we're not capable of that, why not? I don't, uh, let's, say, let's put it this way. Um, I don't know how capable we are. Um, and and again, it's probably naive of me, but I believe that the United States is probably more benevolent than China is. And so we're probably haven't put the resources into it um, that, that China and Iran and Russia, uh, North Korea have. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I don't really know. Uh, you know. I don't have the security clearance to have any of that information. Okay. Um, the next questioner uh, is interested in job losses uh, that have arisen from shifts from high wage northern states to uh, lower wage southern states. Uh, foreign automakers, for example, have concentrated their plants in the uh, U.S. South. Uh, this person says our two Toyotas are made in Kentucky. And could you uh, would do you want to comment on that with regard to implications for globalization? Well, obviously, the manufacturers and companies are looking to maximize profits. So they're going to go where they can manufacture, uh, where they can do it at, at lowest cost. And the low wages, lower wages in, in the South, Southern states was obviously attractive. Some of that was caused by um, the unions uh, in, in Michigan, in particular, the United you know, Auto Workers, really had some really messed up agreements with the auto companies. Of course, the auto companies had agreed to them, uh, 
basically through extortion based on you know strikes and so forth over time. Uh, but they you know they had some really really stupid things going on, raising the cost of producing cars in Michigan. Um, and so there have been auto companies look well where can we do it in cheaper places, places where uh, the, the employees would not be unionized. Um, and uh, that that caused a lot of flight from the basically the Midwest auto industries. Um, so, but that also at the same time left the U.S. auto industries in very very vulnerable to Toyota uh, and so forth. Um, so, the auto industry in the United States had their own stumbles. They had their they created some of their own vulnerability. Uh, it's tried to lessen that by still being able to say made in the United States. Um, in southern factories, but still many, many of the components are made in Mexico or, or, or Canada and so forth, and then brought to those final uh, assembly plants. Now a question about artificial intelligence. Um, this questioner asks, does it matter where sensitive products are made or will it matter uh, if they're made uh, by AI rather than by human beings? Well, AI doesn't itself make anything. AI is really the assembly of data uh, from multiple sources and to, to figure out the most optimal way of doing something. Um, uh, or, you know, for how AI is used is like um, Amazon and targeting uh, what kind of ads that we're going to see or whatever. Um, and, uh, but AI is, uh, is going to change a lot of things. It's been, but it's more a manipulation of data and so forth. Um, you know, can you combine automation with AI? Uh, yeah, then that then that replaces humans. Um, mm -hmm. So that combination that combination can be uh, could be uh, very difficult. And and so the, the manipulation of data, perhaps this question is asking, does it matter where the manipulation is done in terms of the economic impact on individual nations or, or on the United States in particular? I guess uh, where is not so critical as much as the question of who and for what uh -huh. purpose. Uh, and so, um, you know, if, if, if by a country that, whether we like it or not, we are in one kind of non-shooting war with, uh, mm -hmm. I would prefer that that technology and that availability not be with them as mm -hmm. compared to someone I trust more. Okay. And speaking about China, perhaps, isn't China 2025 the end of globalization? I don't know that it's an end. Uh, what it's trying to do is obviously they are trying to get be dominant in some of those technologies that are going to be the most critical in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they're dominant in those areas, that means we're less dominant. <laughs> um, uh, will will that stop things, uh, people, money, goods? from flowing from place to place? Probably not, um, unless, unless we see that as such a great threat that we put up the walls, you know, put up the barriers. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it could be our response to that uh, dominance that would be uh, the more of the reduction in globalization. But I, I think we're, we are going to see a future where there's going to be a lot of movement around the world of future people, goods, services, and money. Okay. If one wanted to reduce consumption of goods, which serve China's questionable, that is nefarious ends, where would one find information on the Chinese content of any given good? If such information exists, what organization collects and disseminates? That information. Hmm. That I don't know. I know if you go to the big box stores, you're going to find a lot of things from China. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't know how. I don't know where you could go where that's not not true. Um, if, for obviously, example, obviously you go to a local farmers market, you know that that's not made in China. 
Uh, but beyond that, I really can't answer that. If an item is created with Chinese produced components, say, but assembled in another country, in this country, is there a requirement that the Chinese part in that manufactured good be labeled in some way? Again, I don't know. In some I, way? I, I, you know, I know on a lot of things you can see made in China and so forth, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, even on, I think, I believe on Amazon and so forth, you can, it says where, you know, where things are made and so forth. So you can, you can tell so that part, but when some, when it ma major components are, come from China and then assemble, like even the Apple phone and, and assemble in Taiwan. I don't, I'm not an Apple person, so I don't know how that's labeled even. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, again, I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, to turn back to the Trump tariffs, this questioner wants to know how much damage did the Trump tariffs do, especially to American farmers? And I'll add to that, have they been lifted now? Are they history? I don't know whether they've been hit lifted. Um, I just I just know um, talking to this is this is third or fourth hand. Um, by the time the farmers got compensated and so forth, a lot of them are made out very very well. Uh, soy, soy, soybean farmers particularly, they got major major payments uh, to to. Um, you know, basically reimbursement for their loss of what the what the what the what they, what they did, uh, what China blocked their sales. Um, and in the end, um, all these products are, are traded worldwide. And so if you couldn't do it to China, they're sold elsewhere. And then it's, then Brazil soybeans are sold to China. So um, how much how much they really got hurt and then they got compensated for that hurt? Uh, I, I just know that um, I, I spent a major part of my career and and farming is a horribly uh, difficult business, a risky business, but um, there are many, many, maybe anecdotes of farmers crying and on their way to the bank. To deposit um, their <laughs> okay, if there's someone in the audience maybe who knows whether the um, Trump tariffs have been lifted by the Biden administration, maybe just put it in the Q&A column and I'll read that answer. But let's move on. Um, do you recall, I think the thing that most people recall about Ross Perot of 20 years ago, maybe, maybe more than that, was the giant sucking sound. He said that NAFTA uh, would produce a giant sucking sound of jobs leaving the United States. It was memorable. Was it true? This person wants to know. Well, I, I think without question, there have been a number of jobs, a number of factories and so forth that have been relocated. Uh, in, into Mexico, particularly right across the border, uh, where where the parts can come right back into the United States pretty easy um, and cheaply, not much much travel involved. Um, so, was it the great sucking sound? Um, I don't know. Uh, that study that talked about lo job losses to China, I didn't see any reference to what NAFTA may have done. So, I don't have any information on that. I know there's been some effect. Um, again. Um, NAFTA generally, and and now the USMCA, I think is a, has been a good move uh, generally. But again, it's those benefits that are widely distributed, and the cost concentrated on few. Okay. All right. Um, in contrast to China's 2025 master plan, and assuming we could even agree on some kind of American 2025 master plan, what are your ideas of what should go on that list if we were to have such a plan? Well, I think to some extent, the, the investment in the infrastructure that's involved in the recent infrastructure bill that's passed, I think that will have some effect. Um, I think that will reduce some of our transportation costs. Um, the investments in the internet improvements, I think are going to be important in terms, particularly in rural areas that are now not as well served with internet as metropolitan areas are. Um, I think uh, some of those in terms of reducing costs of production and reducing costs of, of consumer products because of lower transportation costs, I think will be beneficial. Um, but uh, I, I, I 
one of the things that's mentioned in, in the material is, and I mentioned really briefly there uh, in my presentation, is that we really have a very, very poor safety net for people employed with companies that go out of business because of international trade or other things. Um, there, is, there are very poor um, job training, uh, uh, dis um, uh, support for moving to someplace else where there are jobs. Um, there, so we've not done a really good at those re at redistribution um, of those of those great benefits that the public in general are are benefiting from. We've not done a good job of distributing them to those people who have been hurt. Uh, those those uh, distribution of benefits that you say we're not doing a very good job at are other places um, maybe European uh, manufacturing uh, powers are they doing a better job with um, the replacement of uh, of uh, uh, workers or, or you know retraining of workers in um, industries that have given way to the Chinese threat. I don't know really in the European Union um, how they've done in terms of job loss. Mm -hmm. The European Union suffers more from um, how the uh, Euro has worked um, because um, when the economies like Greece and Italy are having problems, um, they've, and they've got a fixed currency, the Euro, they have a great deal of difficulty in doing any kind of fiscal policy or because they can't run def, run, they can't run deficits because mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not permitted to do that. Uh, they don't control their monetary posit, posit policy. So what do they do? The European Union says you've got to reduce your deficits. So they reduce government spending, which makes the economy go worse. Uh, so they've got those kinds of problems, but how they have been able to address uh, you know, job loss because of international trade, I really don't care, have a feel for. Okay. All right. Now we have a questioner who uh, uh, is, uh, 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 she's uh, pushing back a bit on uh, one of your assertions about America's uh, more benevolent posture than China. She says, in regard to corporate espionage, you stated that the United States is more benevolent, you think, than China. If that's true, why does the United States have 750 plus military bases throughout the world when China only has one? And uh, the questioner thinks there's one in Africa. Well, uh, I, I don't know that I, that I said in, that I meant that U.S. is necessarily the more benevolent. I, I think I more, would like to believe that that's true. Um, whether how true that is, it's a, you know open to argument. Um, in terms of our, our our military involvement all over the place, uh, you know, our our justification for that was to protect democracy here and there, uh, protect the trading lanes uh, in, in oceans, uh, so and so on, um, protect our allies and so forth, fight terrorism. Um, but um, to what extent we are overextended, that could certainly be a, a whole different topic. Um, and um, you know, sh do we need to be every place where we are? Uh, clearly, uh, the pullback from Afghanistan, I think, was warranted. Maybe not handled as good as it possibly could be, but I don't know if there was a clean, good way that it could have happened. Um, so you know, there are you know, particularly if if we really shift to uh, better, uh, better environmental for, for climate, means for climate change, and we reduce our re re reliance on oil. There's whole parts of the world that we don't have to have so much to worry about. I mean, I mean, we could be very concerned about the welfare of the people there, but do we need to worry about the trading lanes for oil uh, at that point? Um, maybe not. Uh, so that may allow us to reduce our footprint militarily around the world. Okay, next question. How is world GDP, I guess that's gross domestic product, yep. how is world GDP determined? Uh, it's a very much of a statistical calculation. Uh, mm -hmm. They're trying to cal calculate the 
the total manufacturing of goods and services uh, in each country and then convert it into a common currency uh, for, to justify for differences in currency valuations and so forth, come up with world GDP and you know, comparable figures for each country. Um, it's, it's a very, very complicated number crunching gather data gathering uh, job, uh, something that I would be bored silly trying to do. <laughs> All right. Okay. This question wants to know, what would you consider the ultimate goal of international trade in the future? Uh, would it be economic integration to make wars less likely, continued growth of world GDP, how to reduce externalities while in encouraging integration? I'm not sure what that last point is, so maybe you could talk about what does that mean, reducing mm. externalities while encouraging integration? Well, one of the greatest externalities that we've got to deal with is, is CO2 in our atmosphere and climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, that cannot be solved by unilateral action by the United States, the European Union, or anybody. That's mm -hmm. going to take all of us. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's going to, that to me is really the highest priority because um, like most of you, you've probably got grandkids. Um, I would like to leave the world at least somewhat similar to what I grew, grew up in. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be significantly changed no matter what we do from here. The question is now, how can we minimize the damage? How can we minimize the change? So that's going to take global uh, cooperation. Um, and uh, one of the, you know, there's lots of things that are that are being proposed uh, for for what we do, you know, encourage you know, electric vehicles and so forth. But one of the things we really need to be concerned about is, can, is there some way that we can influence what other countries do? And and one one way that can be done uh, is with the carbon tax with a with a uh, border carbon adjustment uh, so that if we tax our people for our manufacturers producing uh, carbon dioxide releasing products and another country doesn't then they have to pay a compensating tariff for that so that would induce them to do a similar um, policy that's the only way that i know that we really have any any influence on china and russia and so forth um, but uh I, I do know that there has been some discussion of the carbon tax um, in, the, in the Biden administration and in Congress. Um, whether they are including the border carbon adjustment or not, I don't know. But to me, that is an essential piece. Okay. With the rise of China economically, will we ever see Chinese currency replacing the US dollar as the dominant trade currency? I think you talked about this somewhat, but maybe you want to elaborate on it. Say that, that's a possibility, but for that to happen, uh, China's really going to have to open up uh, their fi financial markets and have great more transparency than they have shown anywhere near willingness to do. Um, so um, possible, but I'm not thinking it's likely. Okay. And now I'm going to say we've got uh, just four minutes left and we do still have quite a few questions. I'm going to try and go through them as, as quickly as possible. Um, I as, apologize to those of you whose questions I don't get to ask. Uh, they're all excellent questions. So let me push right on here. What impact does current U.S. political polarization have on U.S. economics? A terrible impact. If we can't agree on anything, it's hard to move forward. Okay. I can see you're taking my, my admonition to terse answers to heart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, how does lower birth rate and lower workforce participation factor in the, the question of the United States meeting its own needs and engaging in world trade? Well, that's a very big concern for us and you know, those of us who are, you know, over 40, so to speak, um, and supporting us on Social Security as there's fewer and fewer people to support us. Um, but China has its own problems. They've got a big uh, problem uh, with a lot of old people, not many kids. 
Um, and so, and that the European Union is the same problem. Um, so, um, you know, there, as, as we get more and more concerned about meeting our own needs, it's, it's more and more difficult to get political support for doing things internationally. Okay. All right. And uh, let's see, I had asked if anyone knew what had happened to the Trump uh, uh, China tariffs. And uh, one of the audience members responded that the tariffs were still in place as of June 2021. Okay, okay and, and another question: Can you speak to uh, can you speak to potential population demographic effects on global economics? That is, what effect does aging populations, low birth rates? I think that's somewhat similar to the question that you just answered, but maybe there's more you want to say. Yeah, well, um, obviously, as as there are fewer and fewer workers, it's very similar right now. Uh, where employers are having a great deal of difficulty getting em employees in many industries, um, and so that gives more power to to labor. Um, and uh, we're going to have a similar situation, uh, like say in China and European Union, um, and um, so that that'll really push toward more uh, automation. Uh, and cheaper ways to do things without using humans, um, frankly. Um, so how that will affect international trade, um, I don't know how that will affect the comparative costs among countries, so it's hard to speculate on that one. Going back to the smile curve, if manufacturing is not high profit, how can well-paid industrial jobs ever come back to the U.S. or any other place? Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess that's the question then. Yeah, uh, tough. Uh, and um, you know, the, it's it, it. Low wages are not the only thing that's helping countries like China. Um, you know, there's there's a whole array of things that we do in the United States: environmental protection, uh, employee protection, safety regards standards, and so forth, that aren't done in in all other countries. So we're not operating on a level playing field on everything. So some of those things are important in terms of cost as well. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have run out of time here. Um, I noticed that a number of the questions focused on uh, China's role, uh, China's experiences. And so the audience will be happy to hear uh, that our next speaker, next week's speaker, uh, Duncan McCampbell will focus on China's role, China's role particularly in Africa, but I think uh, it may be of, of additional relevance to what we've been talking about. But for today, I would like to thank very much our speaker, Rick Olson, most interesting presentation. I'd also like to thank Paul uh, McClagan in the background who handled the uh, tech uh, material so well. And again, of course, I would like to ask uh, to thank our very knowledgeable audience who always comes up with such excellent questions. So I hope to see you all next time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>